thank you very much everyone for coming today. I'm really excited to be here with you virtually and talk about application lifecycle automation with Cumulus CI. Let me quickly introduce myself. So you know where I'm coming from when I talk about automation. My name is David Reed. I'm a senior member of technical staff. And I'm part of the release engineering team at salesforce.org. The salesforce.org release engineering team is responsible for delivering to you the products that are created by .org for the nonprofit and education markets. And that includes some things you, you might be familiar with or maybe have used in your orgs before, like the nonprofit success pack, education data architecture, volunteers for Salesforce, Foundation Connect, and many others. The release engineering team is also responsible for building the tool chain that we use for everything that we create at salesforce.org. That's composed of Cumulus CI, Meta CI, Meteco, and Meta Deploy. And I'm going to talk to you briefly about all of those applications today. As an embedded release engineer on, part, on this team, I spend my time applying our, our processes and our tooling to real managed package products. So what I like to talk about with the community is the approach that we use. And that's what I'm going to talk about today to manage the life cycle of our applications end to end. Um, on a personal basis, I hold nine Salesforce certifications. My background is in Salesforce development on platform. I do a lot of work today in Python because I'm part of the team that builds these tools, all of which are open source and built in Python. Um, I'm also a moderator on Salesforce Stack Exchange, which is another community I'm very passionate about as part of the greater Salesforce Ohana. And you can find me on Twitter at Aristool. Let's dive in here. I need to quickly walk through the forward looking statement slide. Please do remember to make your purchasing decisions based on functionality that is currently available. I'm going to show you a little bit of functionality that is forward looking today, including a product that is yet to be released. So please bear that in mind and make your choices based on what is currently GA. I want to start today by laying out some of our conceptual framework. I'll talk about the trail to production and what I call the org problem, which is a problem that many practitioners uh, lifecycle management, continuous integration, and other allied disciplines on the platform confront. We'll go through the salesforce.org solution to the org problem, which we call portable automation using the Cumulus CI tool chain. I'll do a demo of Cumulus CI where I'm going to take a Salesforce project and go from a folder full of metadata to a fully automated managed package in about 10 minutes. We'll talk a little bit about Meteco, which is a forthcoming product from our team that intends to bring portable automation and source code based development to the world of Salesforce admins. And we'll talk a little bit about Meta CI and Meta Deploy, which complete our tool chain by bringing in continuous integration and delivery direct to customers. I do want to start by getting cost out of the way. This is not a sales pitch for our tool. It's a sales pitch for our ideas. The tools that I'm going to tell you about today are 100% free and open source. You can download them, you can use them, you can modify them to suit your own any volume without paying us a penny. You will, of course, have to pay for any Salesforce licenses that you use. And if you choose to make use of cloud infrastructure, you'll have to pay your provider, whomever that is, Heroku, CircleCI, Jenkins, or what have you. But these tools, this software is not for sale. We want to share this with the community and help the community use these tools to share their work with one another. Let's start framing with the trail to production and look at the shape of the overall application lifecycle as you're building something on Salesforce. Now, there's many different ways that the trail to production can be shaped depending on what kind of an organization you are. If you're a Salesforce end user, you'll have a trail to production that ends in one or potentially several production Salesforce orgs that your users actually work in every day. If you're an ISV, your production might be a packaging work that you're using to ship a product to end customers who have their own production orgs. If you're a consultancy, it might be some kind of mix of the two, depending on what sort of project you're working on and what, what client you're operating with. But I think all of these different trails have a common skeleton that I'm depicting here. And what I want to call out here is what are the stages that, that form parts of this skeleton and what are the roles on your team that are engaged in the application lifecycle in each of those stages? We start here on the left with initial development. That's where your developers and your admins are, they're hands-on, they're building features that are intended for the next release of your product or the next deployment to your production Salesforce org. They're, um, they're operating based on product design requirements or something like that. They're doing their work hopefully in isolated environments. They're not working in production for sure, and hopefully they have their own individual environments to operate in. 
as they build out those features that are, that are targeted for release, and those features get to, towards completion, you'll bring in an additional role here in the second stage. Your, your testing, your QE, QE team, will do a feature test of some kind. They'll evaluate the new work that's been done to make sure that it's hitting requirements before stage three, the merge, where you take that new work and integrate it into the body of your application as part of a release candidate. Once you start building that release candidate, there's likely to be at least one, possibly several additional testing phases before that release candidate ever makes it out to any customers or end users. I'm calling this an integration or UAT test here, but you may again have more than one phase and you may call it something different. You might have performance testing, load testing, business acceptance testing, whatever those phases are called or what their character is, they're playing this final gatekeeping role between software that you've developed and the end users or customers of that software. And the last stage, of course, is deployment. In the integration stage and the deployment stage, again, we're calling in some additional roles that are part of our team or our community. Our testers come back into play here. Our end users may be involved if you're doing a business acceptance testing or user acceptance testing phase. And as we get towards deployment, we bring in yet more roles. You might have demo engineers. For example, if you're an ISV who are going to demonstrate those new product features to prospective customers, you might have support technicians who are responsible for supporting your existing team. And of course, most importantly, you've got your end users who are actually consuming the work that you've done and using it to enhance their productivity. The last role I want to call out here is one that underlies all five of these roles, and that's your continuous integration system. If you're already practicing CI, you probably have some kind of a build running at more than one of these phases that does automated checks on the work that you've done to make sure that it meets your quality standards that are evaluated by machine rather than by human testers. If you're not yet practicing CI, I'll just ask you to consider that there is a system you can insert throughout your development lifecycle that automates part of the work that you're doing today. And getting into what that work is uh, will be a big part of the rest of the presentation. So let's keep the trail to production in mind here. Remember these five stages and remember above all that there are lots of roles and lots of individual people that are playing a role throughout the development lifecycle. Because the next question I wanna ask is, where do these participants do their work? They do their work in Salesforce Works, of course, but Salesforce Works are difficult. And I want to call out some specific ways in which they are difficult here when we're thinking about making sure that each of those participants has an org, has an environment in which to operate that they don't have to share with somebody else. If you're a continuous integration system, there's some things that you have to do in a fully automated way to run tests at each stage along the development lifecycle. And those are something like this, you create an org, you configure that org, you deploy your application into that org, and then you do work. And that work is running some kind of tests, whether it's Apex tests or browser automation tests or what have you. But if you're, uh, if you're a user who's part of a team that's building this application, it turns out you actually have to do some fairly similar things to get your own environment in which to operate. You've got to create the org, you've got to configure the org, and that could be a very complex and expensive process. You've got to deploy the application, and then you sit down and you do your work. But the problem that I'm calling out here is that in many organizations, not Salesforce orders, but real world organizations, these steps are very complex and expensive. If you've got a big sophisticated application, setting up a new Salesforce org to allow you to use that application at one of these early stages in your development process can be very, very expensive. And it can take a long time. I've, I've operated environments where spinning up a new um, pre-production sandbox environment complete with integrated systems takes six months or, or more. You're probably not in that situation, but you may be familiar with this problem if you tried to use scratch orgs, if you try to use developer sandboxes as an early stage in your application lifecycle. And this is what I call the org problem. The org problem is, is really two, two faceted. One facet is that building new orgs is hard and expensive for many sophisticated applications. And the other is that managing the state of your persistent orgs, particularly if they're shared sandboxes or shared development environments, is also very hard. On the one hand, setting up new orgs is tricky because many traditional tools only do metadata setup. They don't do these other things like configuration, data seeding, dependency management. They don't let you set up multiple org shapes for different roles if a tester needs a different org shape than a uh, developer, for example. And automation that you build in a CI system usually isn't portable. It only runs in CI. It doesn't run in the context of anything that your users are doing. On the other hand, if you're using persistent orgs like sandboxes, it's hard to synchronize those org state with source control. The change management historically has been rather weak, although it's getting better. And it's very easy for users to conflict with one another if they're sharing one of those environments. 
for cost and efficiency savings. So that, that nexus of challenges is what I'm calling the org problem. And the org problem comes with a bunch of consequences for your teams and for your productivity. One is loss of velocity. Your teams may not be able to work at full capacity because they get hung up on infrastructure blockers. Another is loss of confidence. This particularly applies if you're using shared environments. You may find that test results are not reliable because your setup isn't repeatable, your state drifts from what you believe it to be in your org, and your teams end up chasing red herrings and wild geese instead of doing important work to make your application better. It can be challenging to implement modern best practices like use of source control on Salesforce DX, and the alternatives are, are sometimes somewhat limited. They, can not, they may not have all the tooling that you need, they may be very expensive, or they require a lot of specialization on your team to effectively make use of them. So with that as background, I want to dive into what our tool chain does and offer it to you as a solution to the org problem that helps you to ameliorate all those challenges throughout your application lifecycle. Here's the basic framework for how Cumulus CI works, the entities that are involved here. We start just like Salesforce DX with version control as the source of truth. If metadata is not in version control, it doesn't exist. Your Git repository is where every piece of your application must exist as the single golden master copy. In fact, we, Salesforce.org, as an ISV, treat our version control as being of greater veracity. It is our source of truth relative to the packaging work. The packaging work is just another artifact of our development process. The second layer is Salesforce DX scratch works, which are the location of all work that takes place in the application lifecycle. We do not use persistent orgs at all. Our entire development process for, for example, the nonprofit success pack, which is shipped to tens of thousands of customers every two weeks, is done in scratch works. We use no sandboxes whatsoever, and we use no developer edition works. And lastly, Cumulus CI is the automation orchestration engine that sits on top of these, of these foundations and makes the whole process work. And what we're going to dive into here is how that actually operates. We call our Cumulus CI automation portable. I want to touch on this quickly because we'll go through all these applications. We call our automation portable because it works the same way in many different contexts. It's not different for end users versus continuous integration. It's actually the same. And in many cases, it's literally the same steps, although we can tailor to suit context as we need it. We have four applications that consume this portable automation. One is Cumulus CI, our command line tool for developers. Another is Metaco, our web UI for admins and app builders, which is forthcoming and which I'm happy to demo for you today. A third is our continuous integration tool, MetaCI. And a fourth is MetaDeploy, which is our customer delivery solution that allows customers to bring their own orgs and have our products delivered into them using portable automation. I'm going to focus on Cumulus CI first. We'll go through this entire tool chain, but let's start with what Cumulus CI does so we can get a sense of what this automation is making available and how it solves the org problem. First and maybe foremost, what Cumulus CI does is it builds environments for you. It builds Salesforce DX scratch orgs based on repeatable recipes that include a lot of additional functionality. Particularly, I want to call out that we do dependency management for you. So if you're using a suite of managed packages or you're extending someone else's managed package, we can handle that dependency and ensure that the packages are all installed in the correct order in every single scratch org that you build with no further intervention on your part. Of course, we deploy packages or install applications for you the application that you intend to work on. We deploy further packets of metadata to tailor the org. So if there's changes you need to make via metadata meta 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 API deployments in your orgs to get them to look the way you need them to look to do work, we can handle that without including that metadata as part of your application. We can configure custom settings and other forms of settings that are used by specific packages. If your settings live in S object records, for example, that's just fine. We do comprehensive data seeding, in, and we can do it in every single scratch org that we build with one or multiple data sets tailored for specific roles. And we can do anything else that's achievable with the Salesforce API, metadata API, tooling API, or REST API. Cumulus CI is designed to make it easy for you to define these fully realized scratch orgs, complex scratch orgs that include more than just your application to make it easy for all of your roles to do their work. Once we get those orgs built out, Cumulus CI also provides tools for each of those roles to use in doing work in their orgs. For developers and admins, we make it easy to use Salesforce DX and source tracking to develop and deploy code and metadata and to persist it into your source code repository. We make it easy to run tests like Apex tests, Lightning Web Component Jest tests, 
robot browser and API automation tests as well. And we can help you load and capture data sets to further tailor those orgs and make them look lived in, make them look real. And lastly, we provide tooling to orchestrate the whole development process over the level of a single user. Cumulus CI runs continuous integration builds for you. It executes your tests in continuous integration as well as with a single user. It helps you automate parent-child branch merges using what we call Cumulus CI flow. If you're an ISV, again, we'll give you some additional tools oriented around managed packages so that you can upload and test beta packages in a fully automated way, which we'll do today in the demo. And also helps you upload and test your managed releases that you plan to ship to your customers. And I want to call out here that while we recommend using a continuous integration server with Cumulus CI, it's not required. You can actually run and orchestrate this whole development process, including deployments to production, from your local machine. And we have some community members using Cumulus CI who do just that. All of these operations are implemented in terms of flows and tasks, which we call composable building blocks for automation. Flows and tasks are elements of automation that we ship to you and we ship you some standard configurations, some standard flows that join those units of automation together to do useful things as part of your development lifecycle. But we also make it very easy with simple text markup and YAML to recombine, remix, and alter what we ship you out of the box to suit the specific needs of your application and your um, development process. I'm calling out a few things here that are out of the box in Cumulus CI, including running various kinds of tests, doing data seeding, deploying metadata and installing managed packages. There's much more. Um, we've got scores, perhaps even hundreds of tasks that come out of the box in Cumulus CI. And while we give you a skeleton that we'll walk through in a moment for what you can do with a project that you get started on, it's very, very easy for you to make customizations in this file we call cumulusci.yaml that lives in the repository alongside your code and lets you lay out exactly the sequence of automation steps that you need to have happen. I'm showing you here a quick example. This is a flow that I actually wrote in the Nonprofit Success Pack to build an org for use in a trailhead module. And it does some tweaks to what we ship out of the box and it takes advantage of some additional capabilities that we customize. But the core of this is, is out of the box Cumulus CI automation, including installing de uh, dependency managed packages, deploying some metadata from our repository, creating record types in an automated way, installing the latest version of an application, and then running another sequence of automation, which we call a flow. And I know that's a little confusing with visual flow, but you can actually think of them very, as very similar artifacts to do further configuration on this trailhead playground. Now I want to dive in now and show you how this actually works, give you some, 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 something concrete to hang this discussion on. So I'm going to jump out of my slides for a moment here. I'd love to actually do this live, but what I'm going to do instead is show you a video because I can speed it up a little bit and we can get through a little bit more material today. Let's see. Resume my sharing. So what I'm going to show you here is a Salesforce DX project. You, can, you should be able to see a food bank demo screen here. Oh, so we're currently seeing the uh, Google Slides still, I think. Oh, my apologies. Let me reshare here. How's that? Oh, yeah, so we've got a, a terminal in there. All right, there we go. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this project that I'm showing you. It's a simple Salesforce DX project that's intended to model a food bank's schema in Salesforce on top of the nonprofit success pack. And we'll take this folder full of metadata and turn it into an automated managed package in about 10 minutes or so. And I'm going to demonstrate for you I'm going to put on different hats that are part of this application lifecycle that we've modeled out and show you how Cumulus CI will work in the context of each of those roles and help them automate and make more efficient what they need to do. We're going to start here by initializing a new Cumulus CI project in this directory to create a managed package. When you start out, you're going to get a simple interview here. And I'm going to tell, this, tell Cumulus CI that I'm building a managed package It'll ask me for a namespace. I live in Denver, Colorado, so I'm going to call this Denver Development Demo. And one of the other things I'm going to be asked here is, do I want to extend an existing managed package like NPSP? I do. I'm going to make this an NPSP project. So we'll have the opportunity to see dependency resolution and management in operation here. You don't need to pay attention to all of these details here. 
Um, I'm going to call your attention in a moment to how the uh, automation gets built out automatically for us. But first, let's just look at what this wizard has done in this directory. You can see we now have a cumulci.yml file that's been built out as a skeleton for us to start us out with, with out-of-the-box automation. I've got four .json files that define different org shapes that I can work in, different scratch orgs I can build with Salesforce DX. And I've got a robot framework browser automation test that's been automatically built out for me to get started. If we peek at cumulci.yml here, you can see, if you're paying close attention, many of the answers that I gave to that questionnaire reflected here. And I'll particularly call your attention to the dependencies section and ask you to note that we're talking about a GitHub dependency here, not a namespace dependency, not a version number or anything like that. The reason for this is that CumulCI automates the process of looking at a GitHub repository that contains a project, finding the latest release of that project and installing it for you, along with processing all of the downstream dependencies that that project itself has. So it's a very low touch way to manage your dependencies from one managed package or project to another. And that applies whether or not you're building a package or designing an org. We're going to start by running the flow here called dev org. And dev org does pretty much exactly what you think it does. It fits in that development phase early in our application lifecycle, and the intended audience is a developer. Now, I've sped up the video here because a real developer org with uh, NPSP takes about 15 minutes to build. Managed packages take a while to install. But I want to show you what this org looks like after the user runs that single command to get a starting org for this project building on top of the nonprofit success pack. And for those who don't know, I'll note on the NPSP, I'll mention that it's actually not, it's not one managed package, it's a suite of six managed packages that have complex interdependencies between them. And I mentioned that because uh, we saw earlier that our automation de uh, design contains only one line, a GitHub reference to the nonprofit success pack itself. And the outcome of that is when we look, go into this org, Cumulus CI has installed all six NPSP packages in their latest versions and prepared the org for me to start work. It did that by consuming the Cumulus CI automation that's actually defined within NPSP itself. NPSP defines how it needs to be installed and set up with Cumulus CI, and we can transparently take advantage of that work in our downstream projects. That same pattern would apply if you're building a suite of managed packages that each define their own automation and you need to use them together. You can also see that the schema has been deployed here. That's part of our Salesforce DX project. So it's ready for me to do work. And over and above that, if I look at account record types, I find the two record types that are shipped with NPSP present here. They are actually not managed. They're not part of the managed packages, any of those six managed packages, but they are, they are an installation step that's defined by NPSP's automation. And because I'm taking advantage of that NPSP automation in my downstream project, I get all that set up for free. So I'm now ready here as a developer to do work in this org. It's fully set up and configured. I have no guide to go through, no pages of setup steps that I need to execute. So let's put the developer aside for a minute, put on a QA hat. Because what I'm going to do here is I'm going to run that robot test that we glimpsed in the repository. Uh, robot framework, for those who haven't used it before, is a framework that sits on top of the Selenium browser automation library. It makes it very easy to define browser automation tests in a keyword-based format. So it's, it's pretty simple, even for folks like me who have no expertise in browser automation whatsoever, to use that framework and to build out very sophisticated browser automation here. What, you, what you're seeing is not me typing. This is robot typing. And what it's doing is creating a contact by scripting and controlling the browser in the context of this, of this word that we've already created. That's a test that we ship out of the box for every project as an example, but also as a, as a real test to make sure that your product hasn't accidentally broken the ability to create a contact. So every project gets that robot skeleton. It's always available and you can build out on it with greater and greater automation. So our tests have passed, we'll say. Our, our tester is satisfied. We're gonna move forward. And if you caught my typing there very quickly, what we're running now is another flow called CI master. And the CI there is critical because this is a flow that's meant to be running continuous integration. This is the flow that takes place when we merge code into the master branch because it's ready to move forward in the, in the application lifecycle process. That flow has deployed all of our work into the packaging org. And I'm now running a second flow here called release beta that also talks to the packaging org. 
and whose job is, is to do just that. It releases a beta version of our managed package with the feature that we just created, conceptually speaking, in that development work after it's been committed down to your, to your source code repository. It automates talking to the package API. You can see it's, it's got a successful upgrade, uh, a successful package release done there. But over and above that, this is part of our process automation as well that helps you automate your release, uh, your, your whole release train. So in addition to releasing that package artifact, we are also here uh, doing a GitHub automation where we create a release in your GitHub repository. We automatically aggregate the release notes for that release for you from all the pull requests that your developers and administrators have merged. And we make that available for anyone who's, who's, um, who's a participant in your GitHub community, whether that's an internal audience or you're working on an open source project and have your community there watching the changes that are coming into their own works. Lastly, we help to automate, as I alluded to earlier, the merge process. So when we do a merge into master at salesforce.org, we automatically merge that down into all of our open feature branches. So developers are kept up to date with no intervention on their own part. If that's not the flow you want to practice, of course, you're free to turn that off because all of this is modifiable and customizable to your needs, but it's something you get for free right out of the box. So we're in a position here where we've got a beta managed package. We're really ready to do our integration style testing here. And I'm going to run another flow. I'm going to run the install beta flow on a new kind of scratch org. That's the org beta that I'm calling out here. And that, that org is tailored for a beta integration test. So we're going to install this package artifact that we've just created in a completely new scratch org, do all of the setup that we need to do in a clean room environment. And then our business acceptance testers, user acceptance testers, performance testers, everybody else who's involved in that integration phase can go into this type of an environment, evaluate our beta, our release candidate, and make sure that it's ready to be shipped out to customers. Again, we're going to accelerate this flow just a little bit to avoid waiting for NPSP to install. And then we'll dive into this environment. And I want to emphasize again, this is a completely isolated, clean environment. Anything that I've done in my dev org that I might have decided not to continue with or save, that's fine. That's completely confined to that environment. When I go into my beta environment here, the tab, tab on the right is beta, tab on the left is dev. I don't have to worry about skew from anyone else working in this environment or any changes that I've made in the past. I'm ready to start fresh with every single operation that I'm doing here. And so the first thing I'll check is just dive into installed packages. And I should see here that not only do I have NPSP and its six packages installed, I've also got a beta managed package release that we just created of our food bank package that's installed and ready for me to start doing work and testing. And there it is. As you can see, it's a, this is an automated beta release. We call that out and it's version 1.3 beta 3. Because Cumulus CI has also done some um, FLS setup for me, I can go right ahead and begin my work immediately, dive into the deliveries tab. I can create records here, do whatever it is I need to do to prep this application for launch. Just like a customer would when this was installed into their works. So I'm now ready. I am now ready at the point where I could do a managed release. I could ship this product to my customers and have confidence that I am giving them a really great new release. We're going to stop the demo there. And I just want to call out again, we've, we went through the first four of our five stages of the application lifecycle. Um, that's about 10 minutes. In the real world, it's about 40 minutes because you have to wait for Scratchworks to build instead of speeding the video up. But that's how long it takes you to take a, a real schema project from zero to an automated managed package and do a release that could be ready to be put into customer hands. Now, I am going to stop here. Um, I just want to call out quickly that um, the flows that we saw are part of this trail to production. And we've, we've got them laid out here right out of the box for different roles and different stages that are um, part of our journey. So I'm going to stop here and we can go to the first of our quiz passes if I can hand it back over to Todd. Cheers, David. Thank you. Um, yeah, that looks really, really, really good so far. I think we can probably open up um, uh, time for some quick questions if that's, if that's okay. Um, 
we'd had um, a couple appear, I think. One was about installing um, dependencies that didn't have a GitHub repo, so something that was already a, a managed package on the App Exchange. Uh, Jason. Yes, great question. Um, I see, Jason, thank you for joining us. I see Jason's also in the chat helping out. Um, we have a lot of flexibility in how we handle dependencies. And while you get the most bang for your buck, if you use GitHub dependencies on other Cumulus CI projects, because you get to take advantage of their, of their built-in automation, if you need to establish a dependency on um, any arbitrary app exchange product or multiple app exchange products, or even arbitrary unmanaged metadata that might live in your version control system, Cumulus CI has the flexibility to handle that as well. And that, that would even include a situation where you need to install, say, three different managed packages from the app exchange, plus a Cumulus CI project, plus additional unpackaged metadata, and do it reliably in that order every single time. Brilliant. Thank you. So that's, that's a good one. Um, I had a, a question here as well. Um, it was about the robot framework. Um, mm -hmm. And I've, um, in, in some of my development, I've played around with uh, various um, browser automation <laughs> things, including Selenium, uh, Puppeteer, um, I can't remember uh, the others, oh, Cypress IO and, and various and um, things like that. And, and most of them fall over when it comes to getting access to LWCs and due to locker service and um, being able to access things like inputting text or identifying particular fields and things. How are you, um, how are you approaching that with, with robot? Is this a, a kind of thing that's evolving every Salesforce release or? That's a great question. I, I can give you part of the answer. I should, I should tell you that I'm not a robot expert. I'm a, I'm a robot end user on our team. We have other folks who are, who really are the robot experts that do that maintenance that you alluded to. That every time we do a new Salesforce release, we make some updates to Cumulus CI and also to the keyword libraries that we ship with our open source projects to make sure that they continue to operate effectively with new, uh, with changes to the DOM that occur in new releases and other, other updates that need to take place. So I can't give you the fine grained technical answer to how we manage the shadow DOM or do text entry. What I can tell you is that it works because that's the level at which I typically engage with robot um, as I operate with the, the, the quality engineers who, who build automation in the projects for which I'm responsible. They're, they're able to build highly sophisticated robot tests for nonprofit success pack and other packages that interoperate effectively with our custom and out of the box LWCs that are part of those products UIs. And it's folks on our team like Brian Oakley who apply the wizardry that make that happen. Oh, thank you. Okay, and um, so I suppose my concern there is, um, so I'm coming at this uh, from point of, of an ISV, if we were doing that and um, we already have a fair amount of work when it comes to Salesforce releases and making sure that, that, that things are working and taking advantage of, of new technology. Um, it's, it could be essentially a full-time role really being the person who's um, keeping on top of your testing um, to, to, to cope with these things. So you'd need someone possibly like a someone with a lot of Selenium experience to, to make sure that your apps um, identifiers and, and keywords are, are all, mm -hmm. all being, being spotted. Um, okay, that's something to look at. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. But what, what you can rely on if you're a Cumulus CI end user is that in that world, your, um, your interests align with ours. So you can rely on the fact that we've invested heavily in robot framework. We use it extensively for our own products. And it's very much in our interest to ensure that it continues to work with each new Salesforce release as quickly as we can. Cool. Yes, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good point. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, another question here. Um, does Cumulus CI, uh, CI work with other source repos? Um, I'm wondering uh, if that might mean sort of um, ones on, uh, as from Olive, I don't know if you want to um, clarify, was that, was that meaning something hosted on, on another Git platform like, like Bitbucket or something in SVN or? It's Olive there. Any, yeah, any, uh... Any, any source repo, really, yeah. Right. We currently support only GitHub for the parts of our automation that interact with the repository via an API. If you're not using GitHub, if you're using Bitbucket or something like that, you can absolutely make use of Cumulus CI. You just have to be aware that portions of the automation, like uh, automating branch merges and creating releases for your, for your um, beta and managed package releases, will not work. You'll have to turn those pieces of the automation off. 
but all the basic build machinery, um, creating scratch orders, doing setup automation, and so on and so forth, you can use that regardless of your source code provider. We'd love to be able to offer full support for Bitbucket, for GitLab, for other kinds of source providers. Um, if that's something that you or your team is interested in doing, by all means, come talk to us on the Trailblazer community, and we'd love to have, we'd love to have the community be involved in that effort. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, to um, to, to pimp the uh, the Trailblazer community Cumulus CI group. Um, I think that I first went in to ask to ask the next question that's up on the board now, which is um, to CCI work with two uh, GP, so second generation packaging. It's a brilliant that's question. That we're we are very interested in having Cumulus CI work with second generation packaging. It's not in production use yet. But it's something, again, this is something where your interests and ours align. We're very interested in having that tool available for our product development teams, and it's something that is actively being worked on. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to that, that coming through. Um, the next one, uh, next question is uh, from Sean. Is the seeding function just the DX CLI seeding uh, with adjacent plans, or is this something different? Um, it's entirely know different. Yeah, I don't know if you're going to cover the, the data seeding a bit later on. We can. I'm not going to cover it in any great detail. I would love to refer anyone who's really interested to our build applications with Cumulus CI Trail on Trailhead. The fourth module is dedicated specifically to our data seeding tools, and we'll also link you out to our reference documentation for how those work. But just in quick summary, the data seeding tooling that we have is entirely bespoke. It's part of Cumulus CI that our team built and operate built and continues to operate. It's designed to operate on highly complex relational data, which goes beyond what Salesforce DX does out of the box. Um, we use it both to seed sophisticated schemas like nonprofit success packs that include things like junction objects, many layers of master detail relationships, um, relationship cycles. We can handle all of those things effectively. And we can also scale that volume up to, I think the largest single load we've done is something in the 80 to 100 million record range because we use the bulk API pervasively. Oh, thank you, Todd. The, the, trail, uh, the Trailhead module that's about data seeding is in the chat. Cool, yeah, I think that's in it. Uh, from what I looked, it looked um, very comprehensive and uh, quite clever with the um, randomizing on anonymizing of, of generating the data. Um, Yes, I should also call that out. Another of the open source projects that's that's been pioneered by our team is a product called Snowfakery that works with Cumul CI. And what that makes it possible to do is go beyond data capture and loading to actually generate uh, arbitrary test data according to patterns that you define in as large a volume as you need to create it. So that's, that's what we use for those multi-million record data loads. That was really good. Um, unless anyone has any further questions they wanted to ask before we jump into to part two, I suppose, would be a good thing to ask now. All right, I'll let you know that part two is quite a bit shorter. We'll right, get yes, through just a few, a few more applications that are part of this stack and new ways that you can use automation. And then we'll wrap up, and I'm happy to talk about additional questions at the end. And I'll share some additional resources as well for you to dive in. Brilliant stuff. Thank you, David. Yeah, so let's go back to slides. I want to just quickly refresh our memory. Uh, we saw how some of the trails production gets automated, running some real flows, building real orgs to take a project from Salesforce DX metadata that's just raw and turn it into an automated managed package. And we called out that uh, we ran a number of these flows that belong to the five stages of the application lifecycle that come out of the box for every project to use. I want to take us back to the org problem because this whole this whole architecture, all of this tooling is aimed at solving the org problem and, and it's solving similar problems throughout the development lifecycle. I want to call out what we're gaining by finding a solution through automated scratch org builds to this challenge. One, we get increased velocity relative to not having these independent environments that are fully configured available. No one gets stuck waiting for an org that someone else is using. No one gets blocked on, in, on infrastructure dependencies. Folks who are on the team, particularly testers, get to have increased confidence in their results because they can rely on works always being configured exactly the way they expect. There's no configuration drift, no skew from work by other people who are using the same environment. It all belongs to them. 
And not only do we bake in modern best practices as a part of this tool chain, but we also enable them. We make them more valuable, easier to adopt, and more impactful on the whole spread of your application work. And that includes both source control and Salesforce DX itself. And lastly, users get access to these holistic, fully configured and realized environments that encourage them to collaborate with one another, both within their teams and also across functions and with community members if you're working on an open source project. I think that's very exciting. I, I think it's even more exciting to look at our next frontier for portable automation, which is a product that we call Metecho. Metecho means I share in ancient Greek, and that's exactly what it's built to do. It's built to enable admit Salesforce administrators and app builders and other folks who are not currently working in the source code command line world that many of us developers live in to be full and equal participants in creating and sharing work in this source-based, scratch or based infrastructure. I want to call out again, Meteco has not yet released. Functionality may change before this application is released, but I'm going to show you a quick walkthrough video of what Meteco looks like today. Can you all still see my screen? Did I lose video again? Uh, yeah, we got the welcome to Meteco on the screen. Excellent. So Meteco, just like the rest of our, our tooling that builds atop Camille CI, is a web application that runs on Heroku, and it interoperates natively with Git and GitHub. This is, this is our tool to help admins use a friendly, comfortable interface that adds more functionality for them to work with developers who are living in the command line every day. We're going to dive into an example project called CCI Food Bank, which we like to use as, as our example because it's, a, it's an important use case. I'm pulling up a, a project here. This is a project to add data validation to, to the Food Bank project, which we just saw turning into a managed uh, package a few minutes ago. What I want to call out here is that Metaco includes this basic project management functionality. We're defining a set of tasks called add data validation that we can assign to individual members of our team as both the creator of that functionality and the tester of that functionality. I've already got a task in progress called build delivery validation rules, and I'm going to add another one to add some validation rules to another piece of our application. We'll dive into our in-progress task here, and you can see that Metaho is surfacing some of that same functionality that we've already used in Cumulus CI from the command line, but it's doing it in a web interface. I'm the developer here, so I get this card calling out that I don't currently have a dev org to work in. With the click of a button, I can create a dev org, just like I did in the command line with CCI flow run dev org. I can log into it from this web UI and do work there. And then I can come back to Metaho to capture that work and bring it down to the source control. I've already done that here with a single commit to add a validation rule. And that's important because I can then hand over this piece of work, move it into the test phase, and hand it over to Jason, who will be able to create a test org with exactly the same work that I've just created in it. So he can do that evaluation and make a determination of whether it's ready to move forward or not. That's our first and second stages in the application life cycle schema that we've, we've been walking through here. But under the hood, everything that we're doing is Git and source code. We don't have to know that as we interoperate with Meteco, but it is. So I can hand this pull request over to a developer for review and evaluation that's done, that's built based on the work that I've done in my scratch works and captured using Meteco. Developers and other team members can then make comments on my metadata here. We can have a conversation to make sure that we're, we've hit our acceptance criteria and then move forward to merge this work into our application into the master branch. Even as we do that in an entirely separated and divisible way, I can be working on other projects, like adding supplier validation rules here. I can add myself and Jason, again, as participants in this project, or call in other members of my team who get to create their own orgs through Meteco that are not influenced by what I'm doing elsewhere on other tasks, build their work, capture it into source control without having to use the command line, make it available for review in independent testing orgs by other team members, and move it forward through the application lifecycle all from a friendly web UI that helps you get what you need to get done, taken care of effectively without ever having to touch a command line or worry about what source looks like. 
Metaco is, is the next frontier, I think, as I described it, for source control. It's something that we are working on piloting. We've, we've helped uh, some members of our open source community who are participants in the open source sprint program try it out. We're really, really excited about making this a new part of our portable automation tool chain and making it available to the whole community because this is something that we believe will bring admins into that um, developer-oriented life cycle with no compromises on their part and help them do their work as part of a big heterogeneous team that needs effective ways to collaborate with one another. So that's Meteco. It is a pre-release product and I think it's going to be really, really exciting. I should call out because I know many of you have seen the announcements for Trailhead X tomorrow that DevOps Center and Meteco are not the same product. Meteco is a salesforce.org product. It is open source. And uh, that's what we are going to be releasing when it's ready. DevOps Center is an independent effort. Uh, lastly, I want to uh, finish out the picture of portable automation across all of these different uh, use cases by looking at the other tool, tool, two tools in our chain, MetaCI and MetaDeploy. MetaCI, uh, like Meteco, is a Heroku-based web application that implements continuous integration for Salesforce projects specifically. Meteco works with Camille CI, it runs Camille CI portable automation, and helps you implement that orchestration at the level of your development workflow. MetaCI makes it very easy to define plans that run cumulus CI automation on specific Git branches and tags. It reports status back to GitHub, so you can keep an eye on your pull requests on what your test passes are looking like. And it also harnesses that cumulus CI automation to track releases and automatically generate release notes in GitHub. MetaCI also includes features to help support declarative users like your admins, your PMs, or other folks who are part of your team by creating cumulus CI scratch works through a web UI. With the push of a button, you can run any, any MetaCI plan that's defined in your Cumulus CI automation to build and configure a scratch where someone can log into without ever touching a command line. And of course, this is an open source ecosystem. We don't practice any lock-in here. MetaCI makes it very easy to map Cumulus CI automation into your GitHub structures and run your Cumulus CI flows. But Cumulus CI also works great in other CI systems. You don't have to use MetaCI. If you prefer to use CircleCI or Travis or GitHub Actions or Pipelines or what have you, you can do that with Cumulus CI. You can even run it in an on-premises server if that's your particular need. MetaCI is a great application for folks who are working at scale. We use it every day ourselves. We've run something north of 250,000 scratch or builds in MetaCI, but you're free to use whatever tool best suits your unique needs and the needs of your project. The last piece I want to highlight for you is MetaDeploy. If you've been to install.salesforce.org and delivered any of our products into your org, you've already used MetaDeploy. It's our product that helps you to build smart installers for doing customer delivery with portable automation. A MetaDeploy installer looks something like this. You'll see that we're calling out a number of steps here. Install these prerequisite packages for the nonprofit success pack. And that may look a little bit familiar from inspecting those scratchers that we built earlier. The reason that looks familiar is because it's actually the same automation, or largely the same automation. We tailor it for a customer use case to ensure that it's safe to run in a customer org and that it does the kinds of things that an end user admin would like us to do to set up this product and make a first login a really rewarding experience. But it's portable automation, just like any other portable automation Cumulus CI. And MetaCI, MetaDeploy, excuse me, makes it very easy for you to expose that automation in a bring your own org context to let your customers install your work. I want to close with this overall message. Cumulus CI is designed to make sharing and collaboration easy. And it does that in many different contexts. If you're in a single organization, your team members get, get automation, get products, get tools to help them collaborate and share with one another. But it applies just the same way if you're working across organizations. If you're working across functions within one organization or one consortium, and if you're working in the open source community. That's something that's very important to us. All of our tooling is built around enabling these use cases. And we're really excited to see what the community can do with these products to make amazing packages and amazing org experiences on the Salesforce platform. Thank you. I'm happy to take some more questions. I'll close out now and I'll leave these slides open with pointers to a couple of additional resources. First and foremost, 
please take our trail. If you're interested in Cumulus CI, we published it back in April. We're really excited about this and how we can help customers uh, get their hands wet, uh, get their hands dirty with Cumulus CI. You'll, you'll be taken through a sequence of operations that's very similar to what I demonstrated for you today. So you'll see every facet of the journey from starting out a project to building out comprehensive customizations and deploying into a production order. There's also a few more resources for you. You can check out our documentation on Read the Docs. We have open community groups on both the Trailblazer community and the Power of Us Hub if you're a nonprofit or education customer. We'd love to have you come and join us there as well as, of course, looking at all of the open source products that we publish that use Cumulus CI, which we'd love for you to mine for examples and inspiration to use in your own tool. Again, thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you, David. Appreciate um, the, masses of, the masses of work that's gone into um, not just the, the tooling, but obviously the, the presentation you've given us um, today it was good to see that you had the tick on your trailhead badge for the uh cci one <laughs> it's not, uh that's a bit of a cheat for me because i helped write it but yes i i have all six badges you got to drink your own champagne right so that's a good thing um we do have a couple more questions come up in the chat i'll um i'll go through those if that's okay um yes please even if uh, jason has answered them just so it's, it's here for our recording um and then, yeah, if anyone else wants to, to ask anything extra, um, then please yeah, j jump in as I as I finish off. Um, There's a question around, uh, can this pull tickets um, and descriptions from JIRA? So this was um, in the, the earlier stage um, of uh, Metaco, I believe. Um, yeah, no, it, it does not pull anything from JIRA. None of our tools have interoperation with JIRA. Now, of course, it's an open source project. So if you have uh, a use case where you need to interoperate with Jira and you have someone on your team who can write Python, um, you can, of course, build Cumulus CI tasks in Python that call the Jira API and do whatever you need to do. That's that's one of the benefits of, of having this as an open source project that we love to enable. Jira API is very easy to integrate with as well. And um, so, yeah, I'd recommend it on tries it um, quite easily. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's my experience is Jira is it's it's not too hard. Um, I had trouble finding documentation that suited what I wanted to do. Um, but once I yeah, once I knew it, it was quite straightforward. Um, next question: um, Any rough idea when uh, Mitico will be released? I'll defer to Jason's summary in, in chat on that one. We we don't have a hard release date for Mitico. Um, it's it's in. It's actively in pilot right now. It's something, of course, that we're really, really excited about. We can't wait to get it into the hands of the broader community as a, as a full production release. But we don't have a we don't have a firm release date for that. Thank you. Um, and then next question, up the last one in the chat is, um, can I use CCI to start with a production org as a source of truth, clone to a scratch org, seed and perform the testing slash demo? What would the steps be if not starting from a Git repo? Um, I'm guessing this is a broader question than just what CCI delivers, but it'd be good to have your, your thoughts through this, I think. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great question. It is a very broad question. So I'll try to touch on a couple of facets of that, of that challenge. First of all, if you are a Salesforce end user, and what you're building is not a managed package product, it's, it's one org. You're practicing what they call the org development model. You can absolutely use Cumulus CI for that use case. Everywhere we talk about deployment, um, to production, what we're talking about is, is your production org, and you'd use it that way rather than sending, sending your customizations to a packaging org. Um, we talk about that a little bit in our trailhead, in the last module of our trailhead, where we're, we're envisioning you, the user, as someone who's building customizations on top of one or more managed packages for deployment into a single org. So that's absolutely a use case that we have in mind. There are some challenges around that, and one of them I think you allude to in the phrasing of your question. How do you take a production org that is not in source control, turn it into source code, make it possible to build scratch orgs and build customizations in those scratch orgs that you can later deploy back into that original production org? That's a big challenge. Uh, I think we have to do another hour long session on, on scratching the surface of that challenge. I will say it's, you can conceive of that challenge with Cumulus CI as being very similar to what you'll see talked about in modules on Trailhead, like the package development model, 
what you'll end up doing is extracting that metadata from your org. Ideally, you'd love to modularize that. You may not, you may just have a monolith depending on how big your org is, but you'll be extracting that metadata from your org, placing it under source control, and then you'll use that metadata as the foundation of each of your scratch works. There's some work that you have to do, often in a fairly iterative kind of way as you get started on that project, to design your scratch works to replicate as close as you can the actual environment of your production work, which will ensure that you can deploy that metadata cleanly. And I think there's probably some compromises that you have to make with specific features where you, you decide, is the automation to set up this specific org-wide feature worth the cost to me to do that? For example, things like um, um, web to lead, email to case, they're a little bit more challenging to set up with metadata deploys only relative to things like deploying schema into an org. So there's some adaptation process that you'll go through there. And you may end up having a couple of corners of your production work that you don't represent in source code, even though you'd love to. Of course, we want to get everything into source code. But the process of this iteration, um, this iteration and negotiation between yourself and the configuration of your scratch works, I think ultimately ends up in a place where you have 90%, 95% of your metadata represented in source code. You build scratch works that look very, very similar in almost every respect to your production work. You're able to build customizations there, capture them down, and ultimately you can do a deployment of that metadata into production, just like you'd be doing if you were building a managed package in a packaging mode. I think that's a, a really good comprehensive answer to, to quite a broad uh, question with lots of um, lots of nuances in there. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend having a look at the, the, the trailhead again. I think there's one about um, kind of unpacking the soup um, into yes. and modularizing up uh, a, a good one to have a look at. Um, brilliant. I don't know. Um, are there any more any more questions from the folk in the audience? Now's your now's your last chance, or or you can harass David on Twitter afterwards. I'm, I'm guessing, but um, you can absolutely harass me on Twitter. You can also come join us in the Trailblazer community, though. There's a there's not just our team there, but also a number of folks out throughout the community who are using Cumulusi for different purposes. So if you're curious, by all means, come and chat with us. That's cracking. Um, in that case, I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much, David, from from all of us.